Hi, I'm Ann Gaviola. Welcome to The Peak on Global, where we break down what is trending in the business world and what you need to know to stay ahead of the curve. And joining me now is Brett Chang from The Peak Podcast. Welcome, Brett. Hey, Ann. Great to be with you. Let's start things off with the grosser code of conduct. Now, Canada is on the verge of having something in place, and these would be the first ever set of rules for the grocery industry to try to even out the power imbalances between food producers and grocers. Um, but reports suggest there would be no financial fines if one of our handful of dominant grocery chains violate the rules. What do you think of what's being proposed, Brett? Well, I think the important thing to remember about this code of conduct is that it is industry driven. It's not like there is yes. some government regulator that is overseeing this process and applying these regulations equally. They're basically saying that the industry is going to govern themselves. Now, this is good. And I think it's a step forward and that at least it creates some clear rules of how grocers will work with food suppliers. But at the same time, you're exactly right. The penalties are likely not to be that severe, especially when it's their peers that are punishing them. Right. And now they have been talking about uh, the fact that if someone does, you know, go against these rules, you can name and shame them and that might do something. Uh, but other observers say, you know, if they don't go far enough, if this doesn't actually work, then that will be an invitation to the federal government to step in and say, no, 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 we have to fix this. So it's not like this is kind of one and done. Um, I will also say, you know, a grosser code of conduct, it sounds great and it may not exactly be what the public thinks it is, uh, though it is certainly long overdue. But I spoke with a food economist, uh, Mike Van Masso, and he explained to me that these new rules will likely come at a cost to grocers. And history shows that when that happens, they tend to pass those on to customers. So this new thing could actually stoke food inflation. And I'm, I'm going to lean into this pun so hard. Uh, but is there public appetite, Brett, for, for this kind of thing right now? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think there's public appetite for it right now. Uh, you know, the thing about capitalism is that companies are always going to act in their best interest. That's the design of the system. That's how the system is intended to be. And so if there is an opportunity for them to increase that the profit that they can generate and shareholders obviously want them to do that, they're going to take advantage of this regardless of what the code of conduct says. And so there's absolutely the possibility that these costs of the grocery code of conduct are passed down to customers. And ultimately, unless you have some type of government intervention, there's no real reason for grocers to significantly change the way they operate, whether it comes to which costs they can pass down to customers, the amount of margin that they're able to make. And so I'm interested to see what the, you know, we have a first draft now. I'm interested to see what the final document looks like. I think it's a step forward. Ultimately, the reason why industries usually come up with these code of conducts is that they want to govern themselves and they want to avoid a situation where the government does have to step in. So they do need to have some type of teeth to it. But I think we'll only be able to tell how effective it is once it is fully into effect. Yeah, we seem to love the monopolies self-policing model here in Canada. And I'm going to leave the capitalism versus late stage capitalism uh, discussion for another time. It is worth noting on this topic that uh, the food economist I spoke with has done extensive research on what we pay for food here in grocery stores versus the U.S. And he found that regular prices that we pay across Canada are higher. There are a bunch of reasons for that. But the specials offered to us tend to be better than the discounting that's offered in America. I found that super interesting and it's really good to know in terms of, you know, kind of budgeting and planning. Um, so our second topic, let's let's move on here, is about risks in the real estate market. There's a lot of hand wringing and monitoring of residential real estate. But increasingly, I'm hearing that we need to be paying attention to what's set to unfold in commercial real estate and very specifically office spaces. Is that on your radar, Brett? Absolutely. You know, it's no surprise to anybody who works in a downtown core, whether it's in Canada or the U.S., that it's just not as busy as it was pre-COVID. And the shift to remote work has meant that a lot of companies that bought huge assets in commercial real estate or huge spaces and tied their, themselves into these big leases, they're not even going back in the office right now. And so those offices are effectively empty. And while they do need to pay out that lease, once that lease is over, it's unlikely that they're going to renew which then the question becomes, well, who does take over this space? You know, I think besides a few kind of staple industries, let's say finance and law, a lot of these industries are going to look at the costs of having an office space, look at the productivity that's in, that they gain from having people in the office versus what empl employees actually want. And they're going to make the decision that they don't really need an office space, or at least they definitely don't need as big of an office space as they once had. And who's going to be holding the bag in the end of this? It's going to be the uh, investors and the owner operators of these commercial real estate properties. 
Yeah, and uh, the thing that is worrisome is the kind of domino or ripple effect of all of that. And it's important to compare and contrast what's happening here in Canada versus south of the border. Uh, so in Canada, we have a lot of steady hands who currently own commercial office space. So I'm talking about pension funds and other well-capitalized entities that aren't likely to panic and sell at fire sale prices. But the U.S. is a totally different beast where they're able to build more quickly uh, and ownership is a real kind of mixed bag. So a big price correction south of the border could be very messy. You combine that with the fact that, you know, this week we heard from Charlie Munger, the 99-year-old billionaire who is Warren Buffett's right-hand man. He was warning of significant pain. He even used the word agony uh, in commercial properties. He's warned about, you know, American banks being full of bad loans. Those are his words on commercial real estate, office buildings, but also shopping malls and other types of properties. And then you combine this big shift in demand that's uh, starting and probably still down the line uh, for these types of properties, uh, but also vulnerability in the U.S. banking system that, you know, I've been reporting on pretty extensively of late. Uh, that does sound like a perfect storm in the worst way possible in terms of risk. Um, how concerned are you about this, Brett? Well, the challenge, Anne, is that we do this segment every week and it always feels like there's a perfect storm. And at some point you think that the shoe does have to drop and something has to break, which will lead to the type of economic recession or downturn that we saw, in, let's say 2008 or with the web crisis of the 90s. But, you know, we just haven't seen that yet. And so commercial real estate could be part of that. It could also not. It could be highly segmented and carved out to certain investors and asset holders in that space, but not have a spillover into the rest of the economy. You know, people thought that Silicon Valley Bank was going to mean that there would be this ripple effect where a bunch of other regional banks fall. That hasn't happened yet. We do see some instability in that sector for sure, but it hasn't. It just hasn't happened the way that many people thought it might. And much of that is because of the government intervention that happened after the fact. So I'm concerned. I'm always concerned. You know, if you look at the global economy right now, it's definitely on a very shaky footing. And it feels like we're just one thing. And I don't exactly know what that thing is away from some type of major economic crisis. And every week it feels like we get closer to that, but it doesn't happen. I sure hope it doesn't for the sake of everyone. Uh, recessions are bad and we want to avoid them at all costs. But it definitely feels it, it makes me nervous. That's for sure. Yeah, this could be the thing that ties that banking risk and that real estate risk together, kind of, uh, I mean, not neatly, it's likely to be disorderly. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, switching gears a little bit here to the fact that it is coronation weekend. I know it's a big deal to many people, but I, I myself am not a, a royal watcher, unless you count the Netflix series The Crown. I watched a ton of that. Um, but the monarchy is really big business, and there are questions, of course, about its long-term viability. So apparently the 2022 commemorative tunie of Queen Elizabeth is seeing huge demand. It's a pretty good looking coin. I've checked it out with a, a black band of nickel plated steel and it has a polar bear on one side and the face of the late Queen Elizabeth uh, the second on the other. Now she was a symbol of many things. For some people a point of pride, for some people a point of pain. Uh, but this woman, she, you know, endured through it all, remained pretty mysterious. My question to you, Brett, is does King Charles III have the same kind of appeal? Well, I, I think you're setting me up for failure there, and I'm not <laughs> going to make somebody mad no matter what I say. But look, I'll tell you this, just anecdotally, I'm not feeling a lot of buzz around the coronation. And I think that is a bad sign for King Charles. I think there's a lot more energy around it in the UK. At least that's what I see from afar. But here in Canada, it's happening on Saturday and I only know that because it's in the Google Calendar Holidays in Canada calendar that everybody automatically has by default when they sign up for it. And that's the only reason I knew about it. So it just doesn't feel like there's a lot of buzz. I'm interested to see what happens. You know, they've said for we've been talking about for a while, should we end the monarchy? And it feels like the debate that never ends. And I'm not sure it's going to end anytime soon, especially when there's really no cost or real impact to us. And there's much bigger and more pressing issues at hand in this country. Right. And maybe it's not an, a, you know, ending the monarchy type of discussion, but more of a, a petering out that I think some people are concerned about. And there's definitely a generational piece to all of this in terms of how you feel about the monarchy and its relevance. Um, I will say you're more likely to find me watching hockey over the British monarchy. And as someone who does not know very much about sports at all, I think that says a lot. Uh, so thank you for your time and your insight, Brett. Thanks, Anna. Go Leafs, go. Yeah, I'm a Suns fan. Okay, and you can get all your daily business news with the Peak Daily Podcast. It is available for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts.